So the last lecture that we stopped on was still under the introduction of plant tissue culture and we're not done yet, we're going to continue today and we stopped at some of the advantages of PTC and I was going to show you a video but then I'll show you the video once I'm done with all the uh, benefits and advantages of PTC so we've gone through this now some of, our, some of the other advantages will include pathogen free plants later when we look at some of the applications then you know for example Marisom's uh, cell culture then you see why is it that we can get it pathogen free or virus free and then germplasm preservation. Now germplasm contains the DNA of the plant materials. So sometimes when we cannot, we have problems with hybridization, like the conventional way when they try to have plants hybrid. But now with the uh, outcomes, positive outcomes of PTC, we can actually use germplasm uh, techniques for PTC and that could actually uh, prevent some of the unsuccessful rates for the, unconven the conventional hybridization. So in the past, during the uh, olden days, most of the time we need seeds for hybridization, but now we don't. So seeds have all its disadvantages, limited shelf life, require considerable storage space, and uh, there are lots of variability because even within seeds itself, one seed can, can vary with the next. And a year-round nursery production. Now, this would be very applicable for a lot of applications. One of it would be for the exotic plant production. Some of the rare species, extinct ones. Uh, some food production where we cannot have it in normal land farming because we cannot have uh, year-round production as well due to um, the exhaustion of nutrient in the land. And then stock plant rejuvenation. Uh, some of the adult plants during adult phase, they don't grow in a desired way that we want. Some of them, they root poorly. Some of them, they shoot poorly. So with PTC, we can avoid that. And then micropropagation induces phase reversal. So you can see, we have the shoots first before we have roots, right? The traditional way, we always need the roots first. So uh, PTC produce more juvenile plants. And the younger they are, the easier it is for us to actually cut them into smaller pieces, like the previous video, where we can actually have roots cutting or shoots cutting and grow them again via PTC to a new plant. But there are also disadvantages. One of it will be the contamination risk. So if we have seen in one of the past, past week's photos where they have fungal contamination, that, now that's fungal contamination, they can have other contamination from other microbial sources as well. And uh, like I've mentioned, if contamination is around 2 to 3%, preferably less than 5%, then it will be all right. Otherwise, it will be an economical loss. Because imagine, the entire batch will have to be thrown out. Rapid spread of contaminants, wild spread losses. As we can see, we all get it from one stock for PTC. If one of the small baby plant is contaminated, most probably the whole batch is contaminated. So we are not talking about single plant contamination, we are talking about entire batch, so it's pretty well spread. Risk of off-type individuals arising. Now we are growing the plants under artificial environments. We are giving them, we are producing them the environment, we are giving them the nutrients, giving them the hormones. We hope that they are actually growing in a desired way that we want but not necessarily they will grow in the way that we want. Mutations can occur and mutations will occur even in microorganisms. Every five to ten generations we will have very very minor mutation. Maybe one nucleotide or two nucleotides. Your environment also vary. Would you expect that all the uh, small offsprings, all the baby plants that we subcultured, will all respond in a similar way? Although they come from the same explant, the same source, but do you think that when we grow them under artificial environment, they will all grow in the same manner? Have the same amount of roots or amount of shoots and amount of mutation? No, they all vary. So we'll still have to bear with that. Hopefully the variation is small enough that it will not affect the final production rate. And of course, uh, if you, based on all the videos that we've watched, you will notice that you cannot just have plant tissue culture openly. Some of the steps would need, like for example, micro cutting and all that. You will need to have it done in a sterile environment. So most of the time it will be done in a laminar flow. Now how many of these industries could actually 
afford to have a laminar flow. Some of them not. A laminar flow costs around 10 to 15,000 for one. And one laminar flow, normally one person works in it. So if you have a whole production line, or two or three, some, most of the smaller PTC centers that I see will have around two to three, some three to four laminar flows. And that will already add a lot of cost. Now that's just the laminar flow itself. How about the room to house the laminar flow? It has to be relatively clean. Sometimes they are housed inside what we call a clean room. So all that will have additional cost. And not just that, this kind of environment, we cannot just live it like land farming, just live it. Every maybe two or three months, these PTC companies would need to have the place fumigated, gassing, fumigation, to actually clear off whatever contaminants and, and all that. So all these need additional costs. So that is one of the main set, setbacks. It, uh, it needs really sterility, a lot of cost. And some of this, um, although we see these people working with plant tissue culture as purely technical, because they're just cutting, right? Cutting the roots, cutting the shoots. But actually, no, you need to have certain techniques as well. We cannot just expect someone untrained to do it. We have to still provide training. And a high labor cost. So these are trained personnel. And as you can see, the job scope is rather boring. You just sit there, cut, prepare media. It's very routine work, less challenging. It will be very challenging if they keep on having contamination. Then they will have to reduce contamination risk or the plants do not grow well. Now for every batch of different plant um, materials, you will have to optimize the medium accordingly, right? If we are having PTC for bananas versus PTC for ginseng, obviously the nutrients will be different. The hormones will be different. Uh, concentrations will be different. So all of that has to be re-optimized. So that's the challenging part, which is why we cannot just have any technical stuff doing it. Usually they will have a consultant to do that. Right? And then maybe the technical staff just do some of the cutting after training. So that, that is, uh, those are some of the main setbacks. Then I want to talk about protoplasts. Because in the next stage where we talk about applications in food, protoplast fusion is one of the examples that I will be talking about. But what are protoplast fusions? Now protoplasts are the contents of the uh, cells, the plant cells, after removing the cell wall. So we are not removing the entire, uh, we are not lysing the entire cell. The cells still do not break. We just remove the cell wall. And then we fuse the protoplast. So we're going to see here. Now, now these are some of the uh, protoplasts. So it created by degrading cell wall enzymes. So we can use a lot. We can use virus. We can use mechanical. Uh, okay. This one using enzymes. And this is after three weeks, what happened? After five weeks, what happened? So these are the protoplast tissue culture. Now protoplasts are made from two species that we want to merge. For example, maybe we want a plant that can tolerate very high salt content and at the same time have certain tolerance to a virus. So maybe they may come from two different plants. One plant tolerant to salt, one plant tolerant to virus. So we merge those uh, via protoplast fusion so that the, act, the new baby offspring plant could actually have both traits contain genome from both organisms and it's very, very difficult. I'll, sh I'll show you why. Now this is one example of protoplast fusion. So this, for example, coming from um, a plant material that has high resistance to salt. Maybe this one with a high resistance to virus. And as you can see, the cell wall has been removed. We just have a very thin layer of membrane. Now we have to fuse this. So before we can actually fuse this, we have to lyse this part uh, break this part of the membrane so that protoplasts can actually be fused. Now doing that is very difficult. First we have to control that not the entire cell is lysed, so the entire cell is broken to pieces, only certain parts. And then we have to ensure that the fusion is permanent. Sometimes they fuse. After a while, they get back to the original uh, setting. So that is very challenging. Now this is after fusion. So this part from, the, from one, one uh, explant and then this part from another explant. Now this one, once we see that, relatively happy because it has been successfully fused. But don't be too happy yet. Wait for a while. Let's see if it's more permanent. Sometimes they can disintegrate and get back to the original uh, two individual protoplasts, all right? Rafflasia, those are exotic plants. Uh, oh yes, orchids. Uh, when I was in Bangkok in June, Thailand is very famous for its orchid. 
and they have an orchid fair, orchid exhibition. Oh, very, very nice. So yes, orchid, but in the uh, video you see a very different type of plants where I think most of us would have seen it, but uh, we don't see it as exotic. But you will see that they also have a whole exhibition just for that, that type of plants. All right? Okay, never mind. We'll go with uh, applications now. Applications for food. So now that I hope you have a brief understanding of what plant tissue culture is, but I think bioprocess students will have an extra advantage. You've learned it with Prof. Chan Lai King, right? On plant tissue culture. So you would know better then. All right. Now, what are plant tissue culture and foods? Now, there are different types of techniques that we can apply in plant tissue culture. One of it that you saw was micro-cutting and all that, but that's the fundamental. Now, then we have different applications that are actually derive from all the introduction that I've taught you just now, or last, for the past few couple of weeks, and we can actually apply it for food. Now, we can look at embry what I will talk about will be embryo rescue, regeneration, meristem culture, and in vitro selection. Now let's look at all these applications. Embryo rescue to produce seedless grapes, Re uh, meristem culture for virus-free plants, in vitro selection normally for certain traits of resistance, and uh, regeneration for gene transfer and so on. We're going to be looking at that in more details. Now these are the four of it. So all four are actually pretty distinct. I hope you can actually understand the principles of that know some of the examples that is applicable and at, it, at the end of the day do not get confused between these, uh, these uh, techniques. They are actually very different techniques that suit different purposes. So we're going to look at embryo rescue. Now all plants will have an ovary. Ovaries will have uh, ovules and all that can actually be used to generate new plants. That's what um, are the old conventional methods we're using. They basically use seeds, right? So all these seeds will actually have all these traits. Now, crossing plants takes place when we join uh, the genetic materials of two different X plants, two different parent plants. But uh, breeder normally will select the stronger plants and then merge it with another stronger plants. We are not going to select uh, plants that are weak because we believe that the offsprings that are generated from the weaker plant will not be strong, maybe equally weak or even weaker. Now that is the first challenge. The second challenge is even when we have two very uh, strong or relatively strong plants to start with, once we have fused uh, and hybridized them, we may find that the embryos that are produced, the offspring that are produced, can still sometimes be weak. And plants know they have a natural mechanism. If the embryo is weak, they will abort it. It will not be grown fully to a full plant. But we know that they have the traits that we want. So what happens? Are we going to just allow the plants to abort it? So with embryo rescue, what happens is that, as the name mentions, embryo rescue. Rescue the embryo. So before the plants can abort, we know we want the trait. Maybe we want exam an, the same example. We have an explant very resistant to virus and the other explant very resistant to salt, high salt conditions. Now you may think that high salt condition is not important. High salt condition is very important because sometimes in different types of soil, they have very high mineral contents, minerals and salt content. So not all plants can actually tolerate that. Some will die. So let's uh, assume we have this. And then the embryo is produced, but the embryo is uh, weak and the plant is going to abort that. But before the plant could abort that, we rescue the embryo, all right? Now, no offspring does not necessarily mean that fertilization did not occur. Fertilization could have occurred, but like I said, the offspring is weak, the plant aborted that. So that does not uh, mean that, oh, your, your, your um, combination or your fertilization did not work. It, it might work. It's just that the embryo is weak. So rescue weak and immature uh, embryos to prevent degeneration. Now, we normally use embryos, but sometimes the embryos are too small, too weak, too hard to excise, to be excised out. So what happens is that, okay, fine. If we cannot rescue the embryo, we rescue the ovule. If we still cannot rescue the ovule, still too weak, still too small, then rescue the whole ovary, all right? But the main objective is to rescue the embryo. The embryo is inside the ovule, ovule is inside the ovary. 
So dur during distant hybridization, what do I mean by distant hybridization? We're hybridizing from two very genetically distant plants. Uh, just like the example of orchids, we have very nice new hybrids of orchids, but they are still being produced from uh, maybe the same genus, uh, same genus of orchids. Now for embryo rescue and hybridization, normally it will work up to family level, family genus species, right? Anything higher than that will be really too distantly, genetically distantly far. So that is sometimes very hard. Even if uh, we manage to rescue the embryo, it, it may not grow. So up to family level. And uh, during distant hybridization, often the embryo is uh, aborted because they are genetically too far apart, not that much compatible. So to rescue the em uh, embryo is in embryo rescue. First, the embryos are excised out, collect the embryo, after that, we still have to go through the whole plant tissue culture process, like what we have learned. We still have to grow them in synthetic medium, containing minerals, nutrients, hormones, depending on what we want to grow them, the roots first or the shoots first, all right? So uh, this is what I've said. When embryos cannot be rescued, then we excise, collect out the whole ovule. If ovule cannot, then excise out the entire ovary. So embryo culture, embryos are excised out from immature plants, not uh, immature offsprings. They, haven't, they are not matured yet, but we think that they might have a tendency to abort the embryo. Or the embryo is too weak, too fragile, may not work, may not grow. So we excise it out first. Now, as you can see here, we still need to do all these under clean aseptic techniques, uh, in, uh, with aseptic techniques in aseptic areas. So same thing. Same thing as all the introduction of plant tissue culture that you'll learn, we still have to have it in a laminar flow, maybe in a clean room. Now this is the uh, flow diagram of how a plant would look like. Now this would be at the uh, ovary, uh, then we have ovule, and then this is the embryo inside. And this would be the plant material again, and this is the ovary. So inside we have the ovule, this is the ovary, inside we have the ovule, and then inside we will have the uh, embryo, all right? So like I've said, embryos are smallest. If we cannot excise the embryo, then excise the whole ovule. If still no, then the whole ovary. Later we're gonna see a photo of how it looks like. Now, before, before we actually go through plant tissue culture, like I've mentioned, all PTC materials will need to be clean, sterilized, right? And obviously we cannot dump them in the autoclave. So what we can do is actually uh, use ethanol, some sterilization, chemicals. Uh, in this example, soaking in water. Uh, some, some of it we use um, ozone water. So it depends on the application and depends on how fragile the uh, ovule or ovary or embryo is. So directly transfer to culture dish after that and continue to be grown under specific conditions, the artificial environment that we produce. Uh, same process, once the embryo has grown into small, tiny plants, then it can be hardened off, remember hardening off? The process where the plants acclimatize, right? They start to have photosynthesis, they start to uh, get accommodated uh, with less humidity, uh, leaves to have more wax, more roots, more tolerant towards sun, and then hard, once they are hardened, acclimatized, then we can move that, them out into our soil. Now, every time we subculture the, um, the plant materials, the uh, offsprings in a synthetic medium, we, keep, we have to keep changing, right, the medium. So from this medium, maybe just to get them uh, growing. So with high nutrients, high carbon sources, once they have grown, then we maybe we want um, shoots. If we want shoots, then we would need uh, cytokinin. Then if we want roots, then we need oxygen. So every time that we transfer to this medium, there's a risk that different offsprings of plants will react differently. And sometimes they may not grow as desired, uh, as what we desire. So we have to bear in mind of the variation as well. Hopefully, like I've mentioned, the variation is not too big, all right? So, uh, most extensive use of embryo culture now for genome analysis, we uh, 
hybrid, we have hybrids, two different hybrids. We want to see how they actually work. You know, g genome is the base for all living materials, right? Now we have the um, huge projects of the human metagenome project, where we sequence the gene of human. And now they have this service already. If you can afford it, you can actually pay for it to map your, uh, to genome yourself, to sequence your own genome. Uh, that is very important. I, I, when I went to one of the service centers, uh, they are the number one service center in the world, so I visited them. And uh, what happened was that they have actually customers visiting them and then decided, oh, I want to sequence the genome of my son because they want to know what are the potentials and risk of certain diseases. We may not know, but the genes may tell us something. All of us are very prone to having diseases and even cancers. Cancer cells are basically originating from normal cells. It's just that those cells turn cancerous. But all of us would carry those cells. But not all of us have cancers, because not all of us will actually have the induction of the cells to turn cancerous. So all of these sometimes um, can be controlled at a genome level. So from genome analysis, you can actually see certain traits. So for this, for embryo rescue, it's also very important to study genome analysis. So once we have a hybrid, we want to evaluate how's the genome like, how stable it is. And if the offspring turns out to be very stable, very resistant, very robust, then obviously it has something to do with the genome. And they want to evaluate that. So for genome analysis, embryo rescue is a good, good method. Transfer of useful agronomic traits from wild genera uh, to species of the cultivated crops. Now, we would sometimes have the tendency to notice that wild type plants are more robust. What are wild pl type plants? Um, let me get an example. Batai. We grow batai, but batai can also be obtained from the wild. And sometimes the wild ones are very robust because they are growing in the wild. They, are, they have to endure all types of um, nature's conditions. The ones that we grow in the farm are a little bit pampered. Not enough nutrients, fertilizers. Uh, have uh, virus attack, uh, so, some kind of uh, or a pest uh, attack, herbicides, pesticides. But the wild ones don't have all those additional advantages, but somehow they survive. Not just survive, they grow, they flourish, they bloom. So what are the traits that actually make them so robust? If we were to hybrid them with our cultivated one, what would happen? So most of the time we would, we would take some wild species, hybrid with the cultivated species, and then they would end up to have a strong species. But does that mean that every time we hybrid, uh, we have hybridization? The offspring, uh, the new offspring will be very stable. Not necessarily, but we can rescue the embryo. And then raising synthetic crops, okay. Uh, merging all different types of hybridization, and uh, well, we call that synthetic crop. But it's not synthetic as in plastic, it's still real plants. Okay, now one example is the hybridization of barley and wheat, leading to the production of haploid barley, haploid wheat, which are more stable, more productive, having more fruit, bear, bearing more uh, yield. Haploid wheat have also been successfully obtained to cult, uh, culture of hybrid of embryo of wheat and maize crosses. Now, ovule culture, if the embryo is too difficult to be excised, too small, then what we do is that we excise the ovule. And same process, have the ovule, still have to grow it in synthetic medium, uh, still have to transfer the medium, allow offsprings to grow, after that, the hardening process before it's actually transferred to, um, to land farming. So it's still the same process. So ovules are excised from the time soon after fertilization to almost bearing fruits. Then we excise the uh, ovule at that stage. Mostly, uh, ovule culture is uh, tried only when embryo aborts are very early. So it's very hard to estimate when the plant is going to abort the embryo. So right before that, we excise the ovule. Now in some cases, the medium would still need to be supplemented with certain growth promoters. Actually, not in some instances. I believe in all instances, we need to modify the medium. And depending on what medium we're using, growth promoters, different types of nutrients, modification, all these modifications are a must. It's just the same as us growing microorganisms. Different microorganisms will have different nutrients. I've mentioned this many times. And a different analog would be us. All of us eat very different foods, right? 
but all of us grow normally. So the basis of that is what we feed them, how they grow, and what, what, what are they? The different, different types, different categories of plants will definitely need different growing conditions. And ovary culture too. So when we cannot excise the embryo, cannot excise the ovule, then take the ovary. Later I'll show you a photo. So interspecific hybrids have successfully been obtained. Now this is one example of ovary culture of, I think, lily. Yes, lily. And as you can see, the ovary is relatively big. And inside the ovary, you have the ovule, and then after that, we will have the um, uh, embryo. So if, if all fail, the Now, as you can see, ovary will still have to be plated on a, on a plant using plant tissue culture technique, using different medium. And here, I don't know what specific medium it is, but that's exactly how they grow it. Still in plant tissue culture medium, and later on, uh, transfer. Still have to transfer to a different medium for it to produce different offsprings. Okay, um, this is exactly what I have mentioned. Ovaries still have to be excised, still have to be grown in all the uh, different conditions, different medium, suitable for the, uh, uh, the plant e itself. Now, the development of fruit may be promoted by the application of growth promoters. So depending on what's our end target, e are we going to produce uh, exotic plants? Are we producing tuber pr plants? Are we producing... Um, normal plants with, with leaves, normal trees. So all that will depend on what growth promoters we add in. So for example here, if you want fruits, certain growth promoters will have to be added in to promote fruit production. Uh, okay, ovary culture have also been used for the study of uh, plant physiology, plant development, specific chemicals sometimes uh, added uh, to observe the development of the plants and we can compare which chemical is better for what development. Now this is not possible for the entire plant. Most of plant tissue culture technique will not involve the entire plant anyway. We excise certain tissues, certain cells. Now in this case, in this case, when we talk about embryo rescue, ovule rescue or ovary rescue, what are we using? I know we're using embryo. Are we using what? Cells? Tissues? What are we using? We're using organs. Okay, we're using organs. So many interesting health products have been produced, potato, vegetables, lily hybrids, and so on. Uh, I will have a case study. Okay, here. Case study, seedless grapes. Now, the seedless grapes contain no seeds. No seeds? No. Seedless grapes have seeds. It's just that the seeds are very tiny and we cannot feel it with our tongue. So what happens now? Seedless grapes usually have very small, tiny seeds. We cannot detect it with our tongue, but that, it doesn't mean that they are not there. So hybridization of a seedless uh, plant versus a seedless plant will give hybridization of a seedless offspring. But sometimes this offspring uh, will have a very unstable embryo. So sometimes it's aborted. It's very hard to get a high yield if you're conventional way. So germinate the aborted embryo, we rescue them, and then nurture all these embryos under in vitro environment. Now in vitro means in the lab. I hope that by now you understand the concept, okay? So we still grow these embryos under synthetic environment, synthetic medium. Now, some challenges. How do we know when is the best time to rescue the embryo? Different plants will have a different growing process, uh, different maturity. Uh, period. So how do we know that? Well, we won't know until we do a trial and error. We have to grow the plants, observe at what point that we have to quickly rescue the embryo. For seedless grapes, now these studies have found that embryo germination is maximum at the 7th, 8th and 8th or, or end or 8th weeks after the fruit has set. So because of the uh, experimental process, they know it's 7 or 8. So what they do is that they excise, uh, after that, the embryo will be aborted at 9 or 10 weeks. So which means that we have to rescue the embryo before that, before the 10th week. So after 10 weeks, the embryo will be completely degraded already. So we have to rescue it before the 10th week. So an undersized seed, as you can see, is held by the head of the tweezer. See how small that is. Now this is a so-called seedless grape. Okay, It's removed from a sliced grape, and all these are done under aseptic conditions 
sit, uh, uh, environment using a septic technique. Even the tweezer. Remember the video that we showed, I showed you earlier, where they sterilize all the uh, the tweezer, the knife, everything, scalpel, everything sterilized. But remember one point: after st immediately after sterilization, it's still very hot, right? They don't immediately use it for the culture. Otherwise, it'll kill the culture. So what happens is that it, they have to let it to cool off a little before they use it. So same thing here, the tweezers sterilize, cool off a little, then excise the small tiny seed. So the embryo inside the seed is excised, cultured in vitro, and it forms new seedless grapes. So these, I'm not saying that the conventional way will not produce seedless grapes, it will. But maybe the yield will be very low. I, I don't know what's the percentage. I don't have the number in my head. But it will be low because the embryos are aborted. Now with embryo rescue, we can rescue the embryo, we can grow the, 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 the plants. Once it's hardened, then we can sell. Sell it out to uh, whoever who wants to grow seedless grapes. So that is why I said that PTC, although with contamination risk, with all these challenges, uh, where you have to spend a lot of money initially to set up the plant, with all the um, sterilized environment, uh, trained personnel and all that, but at the end of the day, uh, with a higher U, you can sell. I, I believe, PTC um, industry has great potential. So I think you should think about that. Huh? Bioprocess students, think of having your own business. Yes. OK. Now, uh, I don't want to enter the discussion. I will see if I can go on with another one. So the main aim of embryo rescue is to rescue the embryo for plants with weak offsprings after hybridization. Most probably, it will not produce a very stable offspring. Uh, embryos are going to be uh, degraded. But we still want a higher yield. So that is the main purpose. That is what we call embryo rescue. Very, um, very different from what I will, I will talk about later, regeneration. Okay. Technique, I will, give, I will talk more about protovast fusion. So plant cells have a very thick wall, cell wall. All plants have very thick cell wall. So, it's the same. For embryo rescue, we still have hybridization, right? We still merge the um, genetic materials from two different plants, but we rescue the embryo. For regeneration and protoplast fusion, we still merge the genetic materials from two different plants. But here, we are going at a cell level. We're going to the merging of cells. Embryo rescue is already formed. By the time it forms an embryo and over ovary, it's already an organ. Right? So for regeneration, protoplast fusion, we are looking at cellular level. <coughs> I hope you see the uh, differences here. So fusion of protoplasts allow interspecific hybridization. Uh, we still could select what explant we want, what traits we want, merge them. But protoplast fusion will be more challenging because we have to make sure that the fused protoplasts are actually stable. Okay? Now, uh, this is very good for uh, hybridization between species that cannot be crossed with normal breeding or embryo rescue. Like I mentioned, see the difference? Embryo rescue, hybridization already occur. Then it forms the embryo. It's just that the embryo is not stable. Uh, for protoplast fusion, we are looking at cellular level. What are we fusing? Some may be very distantly related plants that cannot be fused. Remember for embryo rescue, what's the um, what's the max not maximum? Yeah, what's the maximum limit until family, right? Family, genus, species. But for what if we want higher higher um, distance than that? We want something of com of two completely different family. Hybridization cannot work. Normal hybridization cannot work. If that cannot work, it won't even form the embryo. So we have no embryo to rescue. So how, how do we do it? We can go through protoplast fusion. So get a very different plant. I, I cannot think of any, any wild example. Maybe lily and patai, something very different. <laughs> maybe not, maybe too, not, not that different, all right? Different families. And uh, try to fuse them and what ha what to, to see what happens. Now, normal hybridization most probably will not occur. But with protoplast fusion, we are forcing it to occur. So we are looking at cell level, OK? So protoplasts are plant cells that have their outer walls removed, partially or completely. Difficult, impossible, sometimes very impossible to fuse the cells, very challenging. Uh, degrading the cell wall is one thing. We don't want the entire cells to be lysed. Degrade not properly. 
The entire thing is going to be lies. You won't have a cell to work with in the first place. Process. We have to make sure that they actually get fused. And once they're fused, we have to make sure that it's permanent. Sometimes they fuse, then they separate back. Now this is one example uh, of what this technique is used for. Now, introduce traits such as sterility into ribseed. Introduce disease resistance into potatoes. So maybe the potato already has its own um, traits that we want. Maybe these, these species of potato can have very high yield, fruit yield, tuber yield. But it doesn't have high uh, resistance maybe to insects or viruses. So we have to get another plant, another plant with cells that are resistant to virus, for example, and we fuse the protoplast. So this is one example of fusion that, it, that has been successfully occurred. Now this is another example of where protoplast fusions, the first stage takes place where we are removing the cell wall material. And as you can see, um, this one remains rather intact. Some of it have already gone through lysis. So these, these cells cannot be used already. So at every batch when we remove the cell wall, not 100% of the cells will be successful. Not all of it can be removed nicely. Some will have, will have gone through complete lysis. So we have to pick what is the best condition, what's the highest yield of uh, cell wall removal. Ah, this can also be applied to yeast cells. Uh, not so much of PTC, just to give you an analog. So some of the yeast cells could also be fused to produce new mutant yeast. New mutant yeast, they are more resistant to ethanol, like I've mentioned. People keep wanting fermentation, beverage fermentation, to have higher and higher <coughs> amount of ethanol, for the yeast to produce higher and higher amount of ethanol. But the higher the amount of ethanol that they are producing, they themselves will get killed by the ethanol. But if we have a mutant yeast that, that are very resistant to, resistant to ethanol, then most probably they can produce higher amount of ethanol without dying. Now steps, remove the cell wall with lytic enzyme. Uh, well, this example is getting the enzyme from a snail's gut. So upon digestion or in the membrane, but how do they survive in medium? Now this applies with, uh, for PTC too. Now plant cells are pretty robust because they have a very thick cell wall, right? But if we remove the cell wall, how do they survive in the synthetic medium? So we have to control. Now this type of technique would need a medium, a synthetic medium that has very high salt content. Now a very high salt content means higher osmotic pressure outside of the cell environment. Now think the other way. How come we cannot have a medium with a low osmotic pressure? How come? What will happen if we put the cell without a cell wall in a medium with a very low osmotic pressure? What will happen? Okay, the cells will burst. So now think again for this technique. We are putting the cells in a very high osmotic pressure uh, environment. What will happen? They'll shrink. No good too if they shrink. Now think of it from the previous um, scenario just now. Can the, stop, can the cells stop um, water molecules entering the cells? They will try to stop but most probably it'll be very hard because water molecule due to osmotic pressure will keep coming in. Now if we put the cells in a very high osmotic pressure environment, cells, uh, water go out, right? Can they prevent water from going out? They can. They have a higher ability to prevent uh, things from going, water from going out than stopping water from coming in. Which is why for um, protoplast fusion, we are actually in the in vitro environment. We are having them in a higher osmotic pressure environment rather than a lower osmotic pressure environment. Okay, so th think think of it that way. So what happened is that um, to keep them intact. Okay, addition of high osmotic pressure, adding shock, uh, washing to eliminate traces of lytic enzymes. Now this is the example of where we lyse the cell wall using lytic enzymes. So of course we have to wash it. We don't want the lytic enzyme to carry into the in vitro medium, and then this lytic enzyme continue to lyse the cells. All right, wash it no more lytic enzymes, then having them into the in vitro uh, medium. Then we have to add a fusion agent for them to fuse. Now, some of the fusion agents here are polyethylene glycol, calcium ions, uh, there are lots. Then after that, mixing. So allow them to fuse. Now again, same like lytic enzyme just now, where they lyse the cell wall. Not 100% is gonna get, get lysed, right? Some lyse over lyse. Now for this fusion agent, 
Um, do you think that all 100% will get fused? No, still no. It will have a certain percentage. So we need to work on what fusion agent at what concentration will have its optimum level. All that has to be done uh, experimentally before we get the optimized condition. After that, uh, induce the aggregation of protoplasts. Now, we want them to fuse, we want them to aggregate. So how to aggregate them? We want them to get nearer to each other, right, for, fuse, for fusion. So we can use different techniques, centrifugation, electric pulse, and so on. Now, then the new uh, fuse protoplasts, uh, protoplasts, they are fused. Hopefully, they are permanent. They form new cells. Then they will have to form new cell walls. So the new cells with, the, with two different um, genetic materials will be formed, and they have to form their own cell walls. Then it's stabilized. Once cell walls are formed, obviously, they cannot separate anymore. Before that, they still have the tendency to separate. Now, this is one example here. Freshly prepared protoplasts. Now, this is what I mean by we need to get them aggregated. If they don't aggregate, obviously, they're not going to fuse. So once they get aggregated, fused, and uh, protoplasts from two different strains, wait, OK. And upon fusion, we can actually see two different protoplasts here. Now, and the new protoplasts begin to build new cell walls. So until they have built new cell walls, they will not be stable. Now, that is the first challenge. Protoplasts have been formed. After the cells have been formed, we may need to apply embryo rescue later. So these new cells, obviously, they will form new offsprings of plants, right? But that doesn't mean that new offsprings of plants can be stable. But this has already passed the first challenge. We have already successfully hybridized, all right? I think I will stop right here. Any questions?